6.45 p.m., B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. Bulova, masterpiece of fine watchmaking. W-E-A-F, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, because of the importance of today's news, we present without delay the Sunoco News Voice of the Air, Lowell Thomas. Good evening, everybody. The White House announces that there will be no new statement until tomorrow. This means, of course, that discussions by radio telephone are being held. Discussions concerning Japan's offer of surrender. Washington, London, Moscow, and Chongqing now framing their decision. When this decision will be communicated to Tokyo via the governments of Switzerland and Sweden, we are not told. That takes time. And meanwhile, the formal end of the war is in abeyance. It even took time for the surrender offer to become official today. The Tokyo announcement by radio came at 7.35 this morning with the statement that Tokyo was communicating with the Allies through the Swiss and Swedish diplomatic channels. Messages had to be coded and decoded and transmitted, and it was not until afternoon today that the White House gave out the statement that, yes, the Jap surrender offer was official. Whereupon, President Truman went into conferences with his cabinet members, and the interchange between allied capitals was on. The whole question centers around the rather unimpressive figure of the Japanese Emperor Hirohito, white horse and all. Tokyo accepting the terms of the Potsdam Ultimatum stripping Japan of its conquered territories and its military power, but providing for the survival of the Japanese nation under a peaceful and democratic government. That ultimatum made no mention of the Mikado, who is a religious as well as a political figure to the Japanese, and that left a loophole, which the Japs are now seeking, with the proposal that they'll give up if they can keep their emperor. What answer will they get? Well, maybe the Allied powers will reply that the Mikado can stay on his throne. Or maybe they'll say, no emperor. Or perhaps they may simply refuse to give any assurance on that point, refuse to concede any condition, and take the attitude that the question of the Japanese emperor is for the Allies to decide. The word from London is that Great Britain is willing to let the Japs have their Mikado if the United States is willing to do so. And the view is that the Washington government may be inclined to keep Hirohito on the throne in Tokyo as a means of carrying out the surrender and of avoiding chaos. It is pointed out that American propaganda leaflets telling the Japs to quit urge them to ask their emperor to surrender. Today, one line of London comment was this. Nobody would have urged the German people to ask Hitler to surrender. And what about China, which suffered so much at the hands of Japan? There have been Chinese demands that Hirohito would be treated as a war criminal, should be. This, however, has not been put forward as the official view of the Chiang Kai-shek government. And what about Moscow? Soviet Russia, as usual, is the enigma. There has been no intimation of what Stalin thinks about the fate of the emperor of defeated Japan. We can only note that the Potsdam capitulation demand was drawn up at the conference of the Big Three, and the surmise would be that its terms were framed with the advice and consent of Stalin, the terms that pointedly left out the question of the Japanese emperor, all of which is reasoning along the rather paradoxical lines of the conditions that were set forth for unconditional surrender. One story tonight is that the Japanese capitulation came at the instance of the Emperor Hirohito himself. The Mikado acting to bring an end to the war and the atomic bombing. This report is from Chung King. It goes on to say that Emperor Hirohito formed a peace committee consisting of members of the royal family and high government officials. The members of the royal family included the Emperor's two brothers, Prince Chichibu and Prince Takamatsu. The committee is said to have met Friday morning, Tokyo time, last night our time, and the decision was made then to offer surrender at once. By happy coincidence, I had an appointment this morning with one of our foremost American authorities on the Far East, J.B. Powell, remember, who for 25 years edited the China Weekly Review. Most of you will recall those pictures of J.B. Powell that appeared in Life two and a half years ago when the Japs finally released him from prison and he came home on the grips home, emaciated, feet gone, weighing just 79 pounds. He had been down to 70, but he gained 9 pounds on that homeward journey, and up to 140 now. First, I wanted to know what J.B. Powell thought about this whole matter of the emperor. 
whether he should be allowed to retain his position as the head of the Japanese government. And Powell said that in his opinion, the emperor was not really very important, but that he might be exceedingly useful in actually bringing the war to an end and getting the Japanese armies in Manchuria to put down their arms and all their forces in China too and Indochina and elsewhere. Who else could do this better than the emperor? And then he spoke of something that is not often mentioned, of how the emperor in Japan has only been an important figure for a comparatively short time. How before the days of our Commodore Perry, the emperor was a mere figurehead. In fact, the importance of the emperor even reached such a low ebb that one emperor of Japan was a beggar on the streets of Kobe. He pointed out how the militarists recently had given the emperor a tremendous build-up for the purpose of completely subjugating the people of Japan and of how easy it should be now to reduce him to his former status. In speaking about this, J.B. Powell referred to the way the militarists have been using the emperor for propaganda purposes for years now. When a Japanese child entered the schoolroom in the warm morning, directly in front of him hung a picture of Hirohito, and first that child had to bow low before the picture, then afterward he could say good morning to the teacher, and of how when streetcars would pass the Imperial Palace, all the people in the streetcar would bow their heads. Well, the Jap surrender was one of the fastest breaking of news stories, flashing through this morning with split-second transmission. In a radio station, a listening post in California, a United Press telegrapher was on the job, taking down radio stuff from Tokyo as usual. The Japs were putting out the usual kind of broadcast in English and in Morse code. The telegrapher was typing out that Morse code, but not on a typewriter. He was punching the keyboard of a teletype machine. And what he copied came out on the other end of the wire in the United Press newsroom at San Francisco. There, news editor Hennen Hackett stood watching a message as it was ticked off on the machine. It was coming in slowly. The Japs were sending their Morse code at a dragging pace, about 25 words a minute. For an hour or so, Tokyo had been broadcasting humdrum news, something about the Jap Red Cross, for example. Then, here came another dispatch, as the news editor happened to be standing there looking. This one, like the others, began flat and dull, so it seemed. The slow-worded bulletin started in this tedious fashion. The Japanese government today addressed the following communication to the Swiss and Swedish government. That made news editor Hennen Hackett feel like yawning. It sounded like another Jap protest about the atomic bomb. Tokyo had been shooting out a routine of propaganda, complaining about the elemental devastation that had hit Hiroshima. And this sounded like an announcement of an official remonstrance through the Swiss and Swedish governments. The bulletin continued in that same slow gait, 25 words a minute. The Japanese government, it said in that dragging way, are ready to accept the terms of the joint declaration which was issued at Potsdam. And that brought a wild howl from one electrified news editor. There it was. Flash, he shouted to the teletype operators in the newsroom, the men who sit at machines connected with newspaper offices across this continent. They immediately started teletyping what he called out to them, the flash. The Japs offer to surrender, he said. And so on for the rest of the bulletin. The first news flash to the American people of the Japanese acceptance of the Potsdam ultimatum. And that's how this greatest of stories broke. Well, from China, we have a story bearing on one curious fact that was noted in the Tokyo Surrender broadcast this morning. The Jap radio message in Morse code gave the surrender offer in a fashion complete enough to be definite, and then interruption. The radio telegrapher was going into another sentence. He was abruptly cut off, and that led to surmises that something untoward might have happened at the other end. Maybe some Japs opposing capitulation had broken in, interrupted the broadcast, accepting the Potsdam terms. The word from China states that a Tokyo broadcast heard in Chongqing admitted that there had been disturbances when that first surrender offer was put on the air, and they were suppressed. So the Chongqing reports that the Tokyo radio has been saying, as the Japs decided to give up, the Russians were driving on into Manchuria, and the latest states that Red Army columns have thrust 125 miles into that province that was grabbed by the Japs. Also, the Russians have pushed into Korea, a sweeping offensive underway. Soviet Russia just able to get going against the Japs as the end comes. It's easy to imagine the celebration all over the world, the shouting, cheering, laughing, jubilation. Or perhaps it isn't so easy to imagine the scenes at some places. Okinawa, for example, where the troops who fought the Japs in such bitter battles, they went wild today, so reads the dispatch. It was night on Okinawa when the news came. The scene in the darkness on that island battleground is described as follows. The sky crisscrossed by tracers and flares, guns banged all over men yelling and beating on buckets. They hammered one another's backs and shouted, The war is over! Nor is it easy for mere imagination to picture the celebration at Chongqing. You've got to summon a bit of oriental fantasy to envision the wild night in China's capital on the Yangtze. 
The city swelled with a jubilant roar from a hysterical mob, says the dispatch. Firecrackers added to the din, exploding in the packed streets and on the rocky slopes leading down to the great Yangtze. Searchlights that once lanced the sky for Japanese planes in this much-bombed city were weaving a luminous pattern of victory in the dark sky. Merchants opened their shops along the streets, handing out the fiery liquor of Sichuan. In other words, China, which has suffered the ordeal of this war for more than ten years, longer than any nation, appropriately put on the wildest, most picturesque celebration. Today's jubilation is tempered by serious reflections of the astounding way in which the war in the Pacific has ended. In the case of VE Day, the rejoicing was simple, unmixed, as in times past. The war has ended. Peace has come. But now, we think of that atomic bombing. The mere start and drama of it would make us pause. Two blows launched from the sky, and Japan surrendered. The cataclysmic force of the atom hurled once, then again, and the war is over. We've been saying this week that the power of the elemental weapon is hardly to be believed, and tonight we can add that nobody ever dreamed of a secret weapon ending a war so suddenly, so quickly. On top of the starting drama of the atomic bomb and the surrender of Japan, we can add that those thoughts that have been in mind ever since the first annihilating blow hit Hiroshima, we can add the reflection that we have a weapon that can exert an almost incredible effect on the politics of the world, the society of man. Also, that the atomic bomb has potentiality so terrifying that it does suggest thoughts of world destruction, as all have been saying. This foreboding was emphatic in President Truman's address last night, in which he dwelt on the need of the highest wisdom in dealing with so frightful an engine of destruction. And the President made it clear that at least for the present, this wisdom of statecraft was the duty of the English-speaking people. He stated outright that the atomic bomb is the exclusive possession of the United States, Great Britain, and Canada. So the thing stands at the moment. But you can never tell when other nations may develop the atomic weapon on their own. Serious thought is deepened when we hear that some British physicists refused to work on the development of the atomic bomb because they thought the weapon too terrible to be brought into existence. And the word is that other scientists hoped that the atomic research would fail. They were afraid that the atomic explosions, when set in motion, might get out of control and spread, leading to the phantasmal thought of the destruction of the world. All of which makes it pertinent to look at today's descriptions of the effect of the second atomic bombing, the destruction hurled on Nagasaki. For example, there was Bob Shapton, correspondent of Newsweek, who broadcast over the NBC. He was in a liberator, ten miles from Nagasaki, and what he saw was a considerable period of time after the atomic bomb burst. Here's the description he gives. It was like looking over the rim of a volcano in the process of erupting, even though 12 hours after the bomb had been dropped. Nagasaki is a mass of angry flames and smoke now, a blazing area extending at least 10 square miles. We saw four huge tongues of flame shooting upward, indicating that explosions were still going on 12 hours later. As for the bombing of Japan, it continues today. Air power striking only a few hours before the Tokyo radio made its announcement of surrender. The bombs that fell upon Japan at that late hour were the ordinary sort, regulation high explosive, tons of TNT being almost an anticlimax now. Ever since the news came in this morning of the Japanese surrender, I've been thinking about our fighting men scattered all over the globe. Having recently flown around the world, the picture is a vivid one to me. Our great air bases in North Africa, the Middle East, and Southern Asia, to say nothing of Europe, with hundreds of thousands of our boys tonight in Morocco, Tunis, Tripoli, Egypt, Arabia, Iraq, India, China, to mention only a few places. In all the history of man, there has never been anything like it, the way our Army and Navy people are deployed over most of this planet, over all of the continents and all of the seas, even in the Arctic, all working with just one objective in view. And today, that job finished. Chanel Salmon in Kunming, our jungle specialist in Burma, the boys I found marooned at remote airstrips in tropical South America, our Arctic weather detachments in Baffin Land, Ellesmere Land, Greenland, the chaps I met at the Tibetan frontier who were buying up Central Asian horses for the Chinese army, that cook who made us the delicious chocolate pie on a carrier off Okinawa, a carrier that a few days before had been hit by a suicide plane. They can all come home now. This that is the National Broadcasting Company.